Hi, my name's Bob Grinier, and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Okay, so in the supernova testing I mentioned in the overview uh, yesterday that I would like to add some boron trioxide. And the reason for this is multiple, uh, but essentially it looked important in uh, Piantelli and Ficardi reactors. Uh, when we were with Piantelli in 2015 January, uh, he told us that the inside of his reactors were made from MACOR, and uh, this comprises of about 7% boron trioxide. And eventually, later, bor boron featured in Piantelli's updated patent as the second most preferential secondary material to uh, receive the ejected protons, which I have concluded are likely a balancing reaction um, from uh, the interaction of exotic vacuum objects with the primary material, in this case uh, being nickel. So, um, this is, uh, in the case of piantelli Ficardi reactors, um, that is uh, why um, I believe boron is important. In the Chalani cells, when we were doing those uh, from 2012, uh, we found our, our first uh, reactor didn't work, and that's because we were going to try and improve it, or rather do what uh, Francesco Cellani wanted to do next, uh, which was to use fused quartz, and uh, that was done in Hug Labs um, by Ryan and Paul Hunt. And that actually produced no excess heat, but on the 12th of the 12th of the 12th, 12 minutes past 12 uh, and 12 seconds, uh, California time, in France actually, uh, we ran one with the borosilicate glass, and that appeared to produce... Uh, around about 12.5% excess heat. And the interesting thing is, is that borosilicate glass obviously contains 12% uh, boron tri trioxide. Very, varying quantities. It also creates some, has some lithium carbonate in there as a flux, uh, which is lithium being uh, the uh, primary uh, secondary material, uh, if that makes sense, um, of uh, Francesco Piantelli and his patent. But I think it was the boron in this case which is important. And then um, Alexander Parkamov's reactors, their core ceramics, contain boron, or there's boron in that area. Um, he actually told us this with the previous uh, uh, reactor materials that we tested the core of uh, in 2017. But uh, I surmised in my presentation at ASTI uh, when I was given the opportunity to present his 225-day uh, reactor, the one that produced about uh, 4.1 mega electron or 2.1 mega electron volts uh, energy per atom of nickel uh, equivalent. Um, I suggested that um, because he had told us in a previous react, the previous reactor to the 225 day reactor, that he had boron in the core, that he likely had boron in there. Uh, although it wasn't in any of the analysis because the analysis that I had at that time um, couldn't show boron. However, in later um, data sets uh, uh, via other independent analysis that were published on Danaeum's website, uh, two people had found boron in there. So there was, in fact, boron in the core uh, or the reactor materials of the 225-day reactor. And at the time, I suggested that um, if you take a boron, uh, four boron atoms, they can go to one calcium. And he saw uh, in his core inside that the cal calcium was going from, let's say, 1% up to, let's say, 20%, something like that. So I suggested this may be one path to get there. Uh, subsequently, um, I established that, you know, the actual main part of the ceramic of the core of the reactor was silicon uh, carbide. And if you take silicon carbon and do some uh, exchange reactions and fusion reactions, you can end up with getting calcium that way as well. But uh, g given the fact that he did have boron, this guy, the, the Cellani, Francesco Cellani, Francesco Piantelli, and Sergio Vicardi all had boron in there. And when we did our Cellani borosilicate glass, we actually saw a, a excess heat when uh, and effectively a clone of the same reactor saw no excess heat with fused quartz. Uh, it does look like boron is very, very important. 
And uh, we do know that uh, Piantelli is saying that it accepts the ejected proton. You can argue about how that occurs, but certainly it would appear that um, Piantelli proved um, in the cloud chamber that there were these ejected protons, and they even persist for a long period after the reactor, in his case, uh, three weeks after uh, his and uh, Sergio Ficardi's highest excess heat. They were still ejecting these protons. So um, uh, boron can receive these protons, uh, but in the case of Parkamov, and, and if you were looking at uh, uh, Matsumoto or, or Shoulders, I would be suggesting that you know a lot of atoms, for instance, of boron, are, are being captured inside an exotic vacuum object, and then it is uh, producing uh, chunks of calcium, uh, because it's a very desirable um, uh, outcome uh, in one go. And so the interesting thing about doing this, and here's the, the boron trioxide, um, is that in combination with the uh, charcoal and the additional potential uh, potassium carbonate that I want to run in the supernova reactor, um, the, what we will be looking for potentially is the production of calcium. And whilst there is potassium carbonate in um, uh, the wood uh, uh, the, uh, charcoal, um, uh, you know, adding the extra potassium carbonate, I'll, I'll come on to why that may be important. Uh, but um, if this is able to take the boron uh, that's in the boron oxide, uh, trioxide, and make some calcium, we can actually detect the calcium in there. Now, there is a bit of calcium in the charcoal, uh, uh, likely, but very small quantities. So we'll be able to, we won't be adding uh, uh, calcium by using the boron oxide. We'll effectively be diluting it by weight. So if you see a very, very large uptick in calcium by adding the boron oxide to either the charcoal on its own or the charcoal with the potassium carbonate, then we uh, could potentially conclude that some of the uh, calcium in the Alexander Parkamov 225 uh, day reactor was coming from fusion of boron. That may have accounted for some of the excess heat in the previous reactor. And it would follow um, the experience uh, of our uh, 2012 tests with uh, Francesco Cellani and the insights from uh, Piantelli as recorded in his patent. Now, it isn't costless to test at uh, Alan Goldwater's lab. He does have materials uh, to pay for and those, uh, you know, and to upkeep the, the SEM and with the EDS. And so... Um, he is saying that we can analyze samples uh, for around about $300 per sample. So if someone can assist with that, that would be great. But there it is. That is the reason for me having uh, boron oxide. This is actually bought in 2017 for the normal Nova reactor, even before we ever thought we would ever see or know about the supernova reactor. But I think this is a, a better thing, uh, a better device to use for this test. So thank you very much for your time and I'll see you in the next video.